Greetings, YouTube. Let's talk about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Now, out of the gate, I love the way they named the movies. Volume 2 and Volume 3. So that, that, that just made me smile. Um, and for me, the first two films are my two favorite MCU films. Uh, with number three probably being uh, the Thor... Uh, Thunderstruck, whatever it was, and yeah, the Taika Waititi uh, first Thor movie. The second one, Love and Thunder, whatever it was, yeah, didn't didn't really. No Ragnarok, Thor Ragnarok, uh, didn't 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 really do it for me. But Ragnarok, absolutely beautiful. And I haven't had enough time to absorb Volume Three to say whether it's going to knock that movie out of that slot or not. Um, it may. I, again, I have to absorb it. I'm really going to want to watch it a couple more times. And I'm hoping that they do a James Gunn commentary track because they did one on the first two movies. And uh, uh, so that was great. I really enjoyed those. And I definitely want to own them in Blu-ray because, you know, this whole Disney may put it back in the vault at some point, which is absurd. Uh, I'm personally of the opinion that if, uh, if a company puts something, uh, makes available to streaming, it should be legally required to remain available streaming forever. Don't put something up unless you're going to keep it around forever. That's, that's what I personally think, but that's just me. Um, and one of the reasons I have a little bit of trepidations talking about Volume 3 is the main character of Peter Quill is played by Chris Pratt. Now, Chris Pratt is absolutely, without question, the perfect casting for Peter Quill, the way he has been written. Ryan Reynolds is the perfect Deadpool. No questions asked. And Chris Pratt is the perfect Peter Quill. And I fell in love with Volume 1, and I loved Volume 2, and it wasn't as good as Volume 1, but I still loved the movie. The, the whole concept of a redemption arc is something that hits me every single time. And, you know, we get to see his father, that he realizes that this is his father. Not, not ego, you know, but the guy that raised him on a ship. And we get to see his father redeemed. In the eyes of the other Ravagers. Awesome. Okay. But I learned after watching the second film about Chris Pratt's political beliefs. Chris Pratt is a social conservative who supported and voted for a fascist, which means he supports white nationalism. Now, whether Chris Pratt himself is a white national or not, a nationalist or not, doesn't matter. He was willing to support a white nationalist. He was willing to carry water for white nationalism. And that has a rather severe impact on my opinion of somebody. If you're willing to vote for a white nationalist, you're not a good person. And I know that people are going to say, well, you're bringing politics into a movie. Yeah, I, I am. Because the actor brought politics into my life. If the actor had kept his mouth shut, and I had never known about his beliefs, about the association he makes with his church, because his church is anti-LGBTQ and they're public about it. If he had never, I had never known that, then I would never bring it up in this movie review, this, this talk I'm having right now. But he did. So I can't put that genie back in the bottle. And it affects my ability to enjoy his acting. Um, but I love the rest of the team of Guardians of the Galaxy. The actors, the director, um, I love them all. And I think they did an incredibly good job what they're doing. Um, I know that some of the people have stepped away. Uh, Zoe Saldata has said she's gone. Dave Batista has gone. Um, that makes perfect sense. Some of them will stick around. Some of them won't. I love the fact that in this film, um, there's going to be spoilers from this point on, so please, if you have uh, put up with my ramblings about politics and things until now, thank you. But from now on, there's going to be spoilers, so be aware of that. I love the fact that in this film, it was really focused around Rocket. Okay? Which is, I think, to me, a good choice. Because Rocket, for the most part, was, the, was one of the joke characters in the first two films. He and Groot, in many ways, were, were there for the chuckles. They weren't the main heavy hitters. It 
they weren't really the main focus because people were not associating them with the same way they would easily associate with the other people who look either are human or look very human. Well, technically, Peter Cole is not human, but that's neither here nor there. Chris Pratt looks human. Um, and while they do, do have some great emotional scenes where Groot shows his metal and his love for his friends and you know rocket willing to do what needs to be done to get the job you know completed and the, his emotional reaction when the ravagers show up and they like take take peter's father figure back into their hearts because he redeemed himself that emotion carried i felt that okay and I loved the characters, and lots of other people loved Groot and, 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 and Rocket, but they weren't the main characters in my book. In the third film, Peter Quill is the secondary character. He is the least interesting character in this whole thing in my book. He is coming across as a guy who's just drinking because he's got a broken heart, and so his solution is to remain drunk, which is not a great look and not a great practice. Take it for someone that comes from a long line of alcoholics. Um, but Rocket's figuring out who he is through a series of flashbacks. He's on a slab. He's dying. And the team is desperately trying to keep him alive. And in the process, Rocket is having these flashbacks of where who he was, where he was from, of, of being nothing but a raccoon uh, kit. I think they call them kits. And being warped and twisted by a madman, the high evolutionary, to become his aid in eventually creating the perfect race. And the high evolutionary has no problem with whatever he does, anything, any organism, if it helps him achieve his goals of creating the perfect species. Which, of course, ends up looking like blonde hair, blue-eyed humans. Huh even though the high evolutionary himself is a black dude. Yeah. There's a lot to dig in, dig in there for the event and that dig in there, if you ask me, but he needs help. And for the, apparently the only time he's ever found an organism that was able to understand what he was doing and actually come up with original problem solving results was rocket. None of the other creations he's done, no matter how perfect they look, no matter how they, they can do all kinds of things. Like he described how one of them, one of his, his you know, pupils could like break down an entire ship's drive and put it back together again with their eyes closed. But because it was rote memory, it wasn't an act of creativity. And Rocket had that spark of creativity. So he wanted to extract that ability from Rocket put it into the next generation of the perfect species, and then move on. But Rocket was never, ever going to be part of that perfect species. None of the anthropomorphic creatures uh, he, had, he had developed, none of the creatures, no matter how human they look, was going to be part of that, that perfect species. Everyone was completely disposable in the eyes of the high evolutionary, so long as they served his ends. And that was Rocket. Rocket is nothing but a means to an end. Funnily enough, Rocket didn't view himself as a means to an end. Didn't view his friends as a means to an end. He felt guilty for the fact that he felt responsible for his friends dying when he lived. There is even a scene where you get to see Rocket communing with the death, the dead, like like on the edge of the spirit realm. And we've seen this before in the in, in the in you know the MCU. We've seen it in Love and Thunder. We saw it in the second Deadpool movie. Uh, where you have a person who is communing with the dead and them saying, you know, yeah, I love you and everything, but it's not your time yet. It's time for you to go back. You're still needed. And Rocket was still needed. And when Rocket comes back, he comes back as Rocket Raccoon. 
as he realizes that's what he is. He wasn't something unique. He was a raccoon that had been toyed with. And he's tired of having to put up with the world that would do that. He's tired of putting up with the guy that did that. And as a line he says in the movie, I'm tired of running. And he and the team take the evolutionary, high evolutionary to task for it. At the end of the film, the main party that we've come to know as the Guardians of the Galaxy breaks up. Peter decides to go back to Earth and find his grandfather. Um, you know, Gamora goes back to the Ravagers because she's not the Gamora that Peter fell in love with. Drax becomes the father figure to all of the children of the perfect species that that the high evolutionary had gotten to it. The, the latest iteration um, that he would probably have just thrown aside and made entirely a new group after that if he'd been able to extract that particular concept from uh, Rocket's brain. And they put together a new team, and that's the beauty of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Because I don't know how many of you have ever looked at the comic books. Go back and look at the original original comics. They had a very different team. It was Yondu was in there, but there was you know, there was a guy who was from a heavy G planet who was like four feet wide and five feet tall and three feet thick and, you know, super, super uh, strong and stuff like that and tough. And it was a great team. I love the concept of an inter interplanetary or interstellar team. Um, and so the idea that the roster of the Guardians of the Galaxy would change over time is what the comics has shown us you know, dozens of times. The, it's like the X-Men or the Avengers. The roster is always changing in the comics. It is only stagnant, for the most part, in the movies. People have this image of this is the Avengers or this is the Guardians of the Galaxy. But the Guardians of the Galaxy is an idea. It's a team. And even if you were to replace all the members, if they have the same mission, they're the same team. The members of the 101st Airborne in 2023 are not the members of the 101st Airborne that fought in World War II. But they are that same lineage. They carry that with them. They know what they have to live up to. And so do the Guardians of the Galaxy. And now Rocket's in charge. And it's a new team with almost all new members. Not all, not all, but close. And that's awesome. That is interesting and fun. And even though at the end of the film they do say, like, Star-Lord will return, which I'm not looking forward to. I don't want the character of Peter Quill to return because of the actor that's playing him. Particularly if they do a Peter Quill solo, I don't really think I'd be interested in a Peter Quill solo because it would be giving far too much credence to Chris Pratt, who doesn't need it. He should not be lauded for his cleaving to the breast of white nationalism. Um, but I would be thrilled to see another Guardians of the Galaxy. I want Volume 4. I want James Gunn to make another film with this team. The team that lives at the end of this film, of Volume 3. Because that would be awesome to see that. To see Adam Warlock in more detail. Because while he's very powerful in this film, he's also very young, very naive. Just coming to realize that, you know, maybe his mother was lying to him. Maybe he wasn't created for a purpose. Maybe he should be his own person. Maybe he should be making decisions for himself and not just blindly following orders that further the, the, you know, the machinations of a madman. So that would be cool to see Adam Warlock in greater depth. Very powerful, kind of ignorant, very naive. See him develop. And I think Rocket's going to make a great leader because he's smart and creative. 
He can build all kinds of things. He can help his team. And I think that we as an audience would really have a lot of fun with a volume four with that team. One free of the taint of a guy who was willing to vote for a white nationalist. And that's important to me. I have nothing but respect for James Gunn. He's gone through the ringer a couple of times and he's come out fine. He's made mistakes and he's apologized for them and he seems to be sincere. The rest of the group of the actors that have pulled this off and the team that supported them did an excellent job in all three films. And maybe volume three will become number three in my favorite of my favorite MCU films. Maybe Ragnarok will be number four. I'm not sure. I got it. Like I said, I got to watch it a few more times. But I loved the aspects of the film that weren't Peter Quill. I had a good time with them. And I'm looking forward to further adventures. And I guess if a film can make me feel that I've not wasted my time watching it, feel a connection for the characters, and has me looking forward to another film, to a sequel, it's done its job. So, let's talk about the Guardians of the Galaxy, Volumes 1 through 3, how we felt about them, and can you disengage yourself from the politics of the actors to enjoy the roles they play? Because I have a really hard time doing that.